Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger. And on this episode of Jill on Money, what's the difference between old and new power? The new power is this idea that alongside the way we used to think about how we influence change, we need to think about how you engage people on their terms, not yours. So you need to work out how you can create programs and ideas that create the space for people who now expect to participate to come in and start to participate in ways that you might not expect. Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. We're presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Well, today we've got a really interesting guest. His name is Henry Timms. He comes from the world of nonprofit. In fact, Timms just finished up a 10-year tenure as the CEO of the 92nd Street Y in New York City. That's a cultural and community center. It creates programs and all this. But under his leadership, this is amazing. This organization helped create Giving Tuesday. And we're going to talk a lot about that with Henry Timms to find out what the difference was between the old way of coming up with an idea like that and the new way. Timms has just started a new role as president and CEO of Lincoln Center. He's just the 11th person to hold this position ever. Amazing. He joins us to talk about a new book that he's co-written called New Power, How Anyone Can Persuade, Mobilize, and Succeed in Our Chaotic, Connected Age. So let's learn the difference between old and new power with Henry Timms. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. Henry Timms, welcome to the program. Thanks for coming in today. What a pleasure. Have you been down to this Midtown section? Do you go south of Lincoln Center at any, any point in the day? Often. Really? Uh, yeah, I, I always like to. I'm, I'm still 10 years in New York, so I'm still getting to know the city. You've written a book, which is very exciting. It's called New Power, and it's very, uh, it's a very bright book. And yeah, that was strategic. It feels, yes. <clears throat> and the subtitle is How Anyone Can Persuade, Mobilize, and Succeed in our chaotic, connected age. Okay, before we start with you and your career and why you wrote this book, we ask everybody one question to start the program, which is, what is the best financial or career decision you have ever made? I think the best career decision I made was my mentor once said to me, one of my mentors once said to me, that the trick with any career is to know when to declare victory and move on. So there are moments when you should just say, I've done what I need to do here and it's time to go do something else. That's very good advice. He did it throughout his career very, very successfully. So I'm not sure I've emulated that perfectly, but certainly the best bit of career advice I've had would probably be that. So one of the things that's kind of fascinating about your career is, which has mostly been in the nonprofit world, right? Yeah. Is that you've gone from different types of nonprofits. So how did you start in this process where did you begin your career well i think there are people who and i've always been very envious of them who will you know emerge age 20 with a view of their future and they'll say i'm going to go and do x and then y and then z and there's this linear progression and off they go and i never worked out how to do that my career kind of meandered is probably the accurate word which is it just i did things i thought were exciting i out of out of school i i ran a publishing company which was my was kind of for-profit experience, which I really loved and, and learned how to sell things, which mm. I thought was a really important skill. And then I went to work for two charities, the patron was the Prince of Wales, both of which were arts charities, which they were trying to persuade people, trying to persuade the business world that the arts were a good idea. What do you mean in Great Britain they didn't? Th- well, it's a little different culture. It's a it's lot a, different. Right? In terms of philo- philanthropy. Well, it's a lot less. So in, right. in, in, in um, we know, one of the great things about America um, my mom is a Texan, so I say this. As what? I say this. I, I'm not very. I'm not a very convincing Texan. I do understand that, but I've got pretty good bona fides. Okay. So, one of the things about America is it has this extraordinary spirit of philanthropy. This this amazing underpinning the society is this idea that people contribute and people join. Mm. And I remember when I used to come to the U.S. when I was a kid, it was like Technicolor. You come to America, and like there was this world of all these amazing stores and all this amazing kind of commerce, but also this amazing belief in community. I remember my, my grandma taking me to the Salvation Army at Christmas and, and volunteering there as a kid. And so one of the great things about America, I've always thought, is this kind of spirit of philanthropy. And so my career in one way or the other has always galvanized back to that. So the Prince's Fund did it like a lot. Of, didn't it do like Live Aid? What, weren't there? And there was a concert. He, that did, was, he did lots of different yeah, things. Yeah. These, these two, he had two specific, the Prince of Wales was very interesting because he was so kind of, for someone who was so um, establishment, right, obviously, mm. 
and very traditional. He was ahead of the curve on so many things. Like if you think about kind of um, his belief in environment, he was ahead of the curve. You think about his alternative medicine. He was talking about that like decades before anyone took it seriously. Let me ask you a very specific question. Yeah, so you know ahead. him. Well, I've met him, sure. Yeah. What do you mean you've met him? You ran his fund? Well, no, he was the he was the top of lots of organizations. Okay, so but, we, we but you've met him. Yes. Have you met the queen? No, I've been in the same what? room as the queen. You have? I've been in the same room as the queen. Were you nervous? Not, no. That would be so nervous. You're like, don't the, screw with me. The, don't no. mess with Texas. I, I wasn't thinking that at the time. That wasn't my <laughs> message for Her Majesty. I, I, although I'm sure she'd appreciate it. You think? Yeah, sure. Oh, my God. Yeah, sure. All right. So you were in London doing this stuff for how long? Uh, for, I guess, the first 15 years of my career. And then did you come here for the 92nd Street Y job? Yeah. I, I, I came over, uh, I guess, 10 years ago. I came over then and... The 92nd Street Y was an organization I hadn't really known well from the UK, but obviously has a big reputation here in New York. And it was it was very appealing because it was an organization that was about ideas and community and the arts, and they brought me into thinking about innovation, right? So one of the big questions with all these great institutions, especially any institution who had a good 20th century, mm. one of the big questions is how do you reimagine this work mm. for a new generation? And that was the remit at the Y. So for those of you listening and you're not in the New York metropolitan area, the 92nd Street Y is, is a Y. It is a YMH. Young Men's right? Hebrew Association, yeah. And there is a preschool there and there are adult, there are senior programs. And you walk in there, it feels like a real Y, like with all that kind of programming. In addition, there were all these really cool programs of speakers and interviews. And, and I remember the first time I actually got asked about doing an event there, I was so very like there was like this moment where i could call my mother and she's like oh my god the 92nd street why like you made it i had a very good time doing it oh that's great so what did you learn there because you know essentially one part of your your book discusses the difference between old power and new power and i kind of feel like 92nd street why is all about old power right am i wrong no i think that i think that largely that's right so the if you think about an organization like the 92nd Street Y, so for 145 years, it has experts who create programs and those programs are presented and they're essentially consumed by the audiences. So you'll come and hear the best economists in the world or you'll come and hear a lecture about philanthropy or you'll come to uh, our nursery school. And so it's very much a model which looks familiar in the 20th century. And that's what we classify as kind of an old power model, right? Which is it's kind of top down um, and we present things and we curate things and people absorb them and, and it's terrific like there's nothing just for the, from the start there's the book doesn't argue that old power is bad and new power is good it's just right. a different way of thinking about how you influence the world mm. so i'll give you an example we have at the y the best poetry series in the country the best poets read on our stage and have for decades you will have if you go there you will hear the very best voices in america time and time and time again that couldn't be more important than ever and audiences for that kind of event are surging so very important to sustain that but it's also important not just to rest on the model of the 20th century and keep doing that. There are very few sectors, I would argue, who have relied entirely on their 20th century model and, and are still really thriving. Mm. So that's where new power comes in. So new power is this idea that alongside the way we used to think about how we influence change, we need to think about how you engage people on their terms, not yours. So you need to work out how you can create programs and ideas that create the space for people who now expect to participate to come in and start to participate in ways that you might not expect. So I'll give you an example from the why. The why for uh, 145 years has believed in community and generosity and philanthropy. And we have lots of programs, you know, Bill Gates would come and talk about his philanthropy and, 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 and Richard Branson, all these people would come and talk about how they were philanthropists in an old power model. Mm. But we create a new power model, which is we create something called Giving Tuesday. So Hold on. Let's just not bury that lead. You are the guy behind Giving Tuesday. Right. Well, we were the team of All right. Hold on a Tuesday. second. Hold on. Let me give you your... Let me give you some nice shower something on you. But I... <laughs> that's, that's that. All right. So you are part of the team. Yeah. Good. And, you know, you have this, this idea of philanthropy. Yeah. It's important to the 92nd yeah. Street Y. Tell me, tell the listeners... How did this idea come to fruition? What happened that created this idea? So I think it was very much that the, we were thinking about how we could create new models for our work, right? So, so the idea was, if you think about the why, it creates, it's a community center, right? People come together as a community. 
So the question then is how do you create community in a digital age? With people connecting online, how do you create a different mm-hmm. type of community? So the idea was we knew about Black Friday and Cyber Monday, which had grown, Cyber Monday in particular, had grown supercharged by the internet, which allowed retailers everywhere to collaborate and put deals on sale. And we all remember those, you know, the pictures of people lining up outside the stores fighting each other to get TVs. Yes, right? or, or Furbies or whatever they were doing. The, did you get a Furby ever? I know. No, very wise. <laughs> um, so, the, so, the, so we were thinking about that and we were thinking, all right, this is supposed to be the giving season. That's what we talk about. But this is, these aren't stories about giving. These are stories about consumption. So could we add a Giving Tuesday after Black Friday and Cyber Monday? Could we add a Giving Tuesday? And so if you'd thought about that project in an old power way, you would say, let's call it the 92nd Street Wise Giving Tuesday, right? Mm-hmm. We would put our logo in it. Right. We, we would make sure that everyone gave us credit for that project if they took part. Right. And we'd probably work out some clever way to charge people 100 bucks each. Right. That's how you'd think about it from yeah. an old power perspective. But we didn't. To the great credit of the board of directors at the Y, they really invested in, in, in some new thinking and they said, let's do this in a new power way. So the new power way of thinking about something like Giving Tuesday was we didn't brand it at all. So lots of people don't know that we created it. They will now. Well, they will now, right. Well, I, <laughs> um, and, 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 and it didn't really matter. What we wanted to do with that was create something that people could grab and then turn into a project that became more interesting. Mm-hmm. So what happened with Giving Tuesday that was, was so fascinating was from the very beginning, people would, would grab bits of it and turning it into something more important. So in Baltimore, in the first year, Giving Tuesday is seven years old now. So, 20, year, so what 2012. year 2012. In the first year of Giving Tuesday, Baltimore grabbed Giving Tuesday. And they said, we're not going to call it Giving Tuesday. We're going to call it Be More Gives More. Baltimore Gives More. And we're going to prove that we're the most generous city in America. Right? Lovely idea. Yeah. They brought the whole community together and they raised over $5 million for local causes in the first year. And in the old power world, if someone took your brand, changed Giving Tuesday into Be More Gives More, you'd call them up and sue them, right? You'd right. say cease and desist. But of course, in the new power world, this this is exactly what we're wanting to see. We're seeing people grab this and take it somewhere new mm. and in the spirit of what the 92nd Street Y stands for. So cut forward seven years, Giving Tuesday has now raised over a billion dollars online, just online in the US, average gift size of about 100 bucks. And Giving Tuesday has spread to 100 countries around the world. So last year in the Ukraine on Giving Tuesday, teachers in dozens of schools around the country taught lessons in kindness. Right? They taught lessons in In Barbados, there was a big blood drive for mm. Giving Tuesday. In Singapore, Giving Tuesday is a whole week dedicated to volunteering. Mm-hmm. So all around the world, people took the stem of the idea that we put into the market. They made it more about them, more local, more actionable, and that's how they took it to scale. And that's the difference between old power and new power, which is Interesting. you're not just creating these kind of these brands that want to be admired and replicated. You're creating these changeable ideas that people can grab and make their own. Right. It's like open source code. Like we're going to say, okay, whoever wants to do whatever you want to yep. do with it. And of course, it must have inured to your benefit because when you took over at the 92nd Street Y, the institution had a pretty hefty deficit. Right. And you left and that deficit had been eradicated. Eradicated, is that correct? Yeah, we're gonna. We've. we've I like you still say we because you sort of like it's very recent. I'm still in the job. I still. I haven't left yet. I don't. No, I've got another ten days. So it it is. It is still. It it is still we. Then it's we. Um. So we. we, Yeah, we were. We've. We've made a. You know, multi-million dollar improvement to the to the bottom line, and I'll leave with a very positive surplus. Um. And from an institutional perspective, the thing we were thinking about on the why, with this kind of project, and this was just one of many projects. And it's really challenging for institutions in particular, which is, can you hand on heart think that your next 10 years will be your best? Mm. Right. Most great institutions don't think that. That's interesting. They think, you know, they, they have great histories and they're very proud of when yeah. they did X or Y, but they don't hand on heart think the next 10 years really could be the best we've ever had. Um, and we do think that at the 92nd Street Y. And, and one of the reasons for that is I think people have been, people have done the hard work of getting the revenues right and getting the programming right. What was... Just the most annoying part of your job. <laughs> what did, I mean, like everyone hates per- certain aspects of their job. What did you hate doing? I didn't hate any of it. I found it frustrating when things weren't moving quickly enough. I mm. really struggled with that. Is that just endemic to nonprofits? No, because that feels like a very nonprofity complaint. No, I don't. I think it's endemic. Actually, I think it's worse in the corporate world. Really? Truthfully, yeah. If you the the the, the great myth is that the corporate world is somehow terribly fast moving and speedy, but actually, the people I hear the most complaints from amongst my friends are stuck inside big corporate machines that actually aren't Amazing. changing quickly enough. It really is. So now, here's here's my next question. Mm-hmm. 
You are 10 days away. Are you going to take some vacation in between jobs? No. What? Well, but Are I've, you nutty? The th- here was my thinking. Uh-huh. The, the, there's a lot to do at yes. Lincoln Center. There's, there's a lot to do at the Y to, yeah. to kind of finish out. Yep. And so I, I, I thought it would be good just to, I think me, in, all these, in all these roles, right, momentum is very important. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the Y, we're just finishing up a big capital campaign and we're coming, we've got a, a board meeting coming up and it's kind of a, trying to get to a crescendo there. And then Lincoln Center, we have to, you know, begin a new chapter at Lincoln Center. So, so time is of the essence. But, but I would say this, because I think it's really important. We always talk about this. Um, one of the most important initiatives that, that we did at the Y was around wellness and actually people thinking about their own mental health and their own physical health and all of those good things. So I do take that very seriously. Mm. So you are the 11th person to hold the position of president and CEO of Lincoln Center. Um, you're replacing Deborah Spar, who was the uh, former president of Barnard, who then took the job and was out on her ass after a year. We won't talk about the reason why, because no one really knows, although I hear lots of scuttlebutt. But OK, you're walking into this organization that is clearly having some issues. How would you describe, um, just using some of the language of the book, the old power values that might be within Lincoln Center versus the new power values that you think would have to be adopted to make the next 10 years the best 10 years? So I think that's the, exactly the right question. And the on one side of it, you think about Lincoln Center. If you think about the original vision for Lincoln Center, so back in the you know 60 years, 60 years it's 60 years old now, mm-hmm. just about to hit 60. The original vision was at the height of the Cold War, Right, so if you can think about what Lincoln Center began as, it began in some senses as as, as kind of this exhibition of democracy. Right, it was this idea that Lincoln Center, the, the Rockefeller vision for Lincoln Center, was you had both this excellence, right? You believed in the very best of the performing arts, and and I I would certainly say that one of the things which is most important about Lincoln Center is you have on that campus some of the most ambitious, the most learned, the most rigorous creators and performers in the world. Can you just tick off the organizations underneath the Lincoln Center umbrella for those listeners? Yeah, so there, so there are um, there are a lot of them. So you have the, the Met Opera, you have the Philharmonic, you have the Ballet, you have the Chamber Music Society, you have Jazz at Lincoln Center, you have the New York uh, Library for the Performing Arts, you have Lincoln Center itself, uh, you have the Juilliard. Uh, Juilliard. You have the School of American um, Ballet, and the whole vision of um, the old original vision of Lincoln Center was that all of these organizations would be close together for a reason. Mm-hmm. Right. The reason they would be close together is because it would be a force multiplier. That you would have this moment where you'd have this kind of laboratory where everything would come together. And so the the second thing I think, if you think about the, the original founding principles of Lincoln Center, which remain key priorities. The first, I think, is this idea around excellence, around the the very best, uh, and that could not be more important, particularly in a world awash with so much data and information and nonsense that actually people are desperately to seek out the very best. But the other part of the original vision of Lincoln Center, which I think couldn't be more relevant today, is about breadth. It wasn't just about the best, it was about the most. It was about how could you get the arts to as many people as possible. And that's where I think kind of the new power world comes in. So if you think about the the new power world, what's so interesting about new power is we've never had more more filmmakers than we do now. We've never had more poets. We've never had more composers. We've never had more singers. We've never had more dancers. There's an amazing world emerging, particularly via social media, of people who are performing in new ways. Mm-hmm. So that's a really interesting question for any institution, which is what do we do with that? What do mm. we do about this generation of people who expect to participate, who want to engage in meaningful ways with the arts, what is the role of something like Lincoln Center to connect with them on their terms, not necessarily on ours? So that I think as you think about kind of framing questions for the future, one of the questions for Lincoln Center, I think, is what do we do with this huge supply side we now have? We'll get back to our interview with Henry Timms after a short break. This is Jill on Money. Hi, I'm Jill Schlesinger, certified financial planner, CBS News business analyst, and host of the Jill on Money podcast. And I'm here to tell you that the Jill on Money podcast has a new sponsor, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Marcus is part of a storied company that's been a leader in financial services for generations and offers simple, secure access to FDIC-insured savings products, including a high-yield online savings account that earns four times the national average. Marcus also offers educational articles and videos to help you get better about your finances. 
which you can find in the resources section on Marcus.com. So check it out. You can money. National average data provided by Informa and accuracy cannot be guaranteed. Marcus Deposits products provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. Okay, now back to our interview with Henry Timms. Presumably, you're coming in in 10 days and you're going to build out your own team. Mm -hmm. And you're walking into an organization that has existing people who are there. Some of them might not be thrilled in this moment. Transitions are hard. How do you look at leadership? And in the book, you describe what the new power team is. And then you also describe false prophets, which I love. Coming from a very old institution here, you are sitting in the nexus of CBS's news radio, which has been around, I think, since Mark, 1928. I think that's it, 1928. Doing pretty well. Not bad. We're still yeah. here. The, the equipment is uh, now ba- basically from 1968, so right. we're making some progress. How do you think about leadership in the new power, false profit mm-hmm. dichotomy? So I think one of the one of the things that works well from from a new power perspective, if you think about you're trying to create collaboration is essentially the new power skill, right? Mm -hmm. So the old power leader, you have the superstar leader who who takes up a lot of space and is essentially revered and it becomes all about them and their own agency. That isn't, I think, the way that you build terrific teams in a new power way and and especially not the way you build terrific movements. Um, More, If you're trying to get more people engaged in things that matter, one of the ways to do that is to be more collaborative, I think, to be less about taking up space yourself and more about trying to create the space for others. Mm. So much of the the job, I think, the, the way I hope I've approached the why and certainly I intend to approach Lincoln Center is um, to set a tone of collaboration, to very much be about building alliances and partnerships with people who are so minded because we as a sector, uh, by which I mean the art sector, it's very easy to to fall into this habit of everyone being very separate, right? We all have our own projects and we all have the things we care about but we all also share a core mission right there is an argument that the the arts in a world which technology has made us feel so dislocated so disconnected mm. the arts are perhaps the most human expression it's the way we understand ourselves it's the way we understand each other right before there were countries or languages or finances or banks there were artists right the very first testaments of man were how we expressed ourselves. and so i think one of the big challenges for and huge opportunities for all of us in the arts is to make a more cohesive argument around not just what we're for which is the arts are good for you and they make you better at maths and all those arguments we know but also what we're against right and the arts do stand against something they stand against a world where we feel forced apart they stand against a world where we feel empty mm-hmm. they stand against the world where We feel like we don't understand other people and we're all backing into our corners. The arts at their best um, bridge those divides and they help us find ourselves and each other. And so I'm really very focused on on that set of arguments. And uh, that idea that you laid out in the book about made to stick versus made to spread, that I think that spreading that sort of humanity is core to the mission. So my next thought when I hear you talk like that is I say, yeah, you know, you go to the opera, you go to the ballet and you see a lot of altacacas. You know what I mean? You know that word from 10 I, years I, in New York, I, I, right? I do, yes. Mm-hmm. I'm well-versed. So, and so how do we bring young people in? I mean, honestly, you go to the Metropolitan Opera, it literally feels like, well, okay, we are all eight minutes away from being in the ICU with all these people. So how do we bring younger people in? Well, so I think, A, I think we should resist that that stereotype because I actually don't think the data backs it up. I think all what right. you see is lots of audiences of different ages on campus. Good to know. And B, I think one of the things I think you can look around campus and see which is, is most impressive is the way in which people are finding ways to reconnect people with the arts in, in interesting ways. So my my uh, my colleague Deborah Border at the at the Phil at the Philharmonic has done a terrific series called Project Nineteen, mm-hmm. which is uh, nineteen commissions from female composers to mark the hundredth anniversary of the Nineteenth Amendment. And you look at the audiences who are attracted to events like that, and you're seeing people who are feeling very much that this is speaking to them and mm. speaking to the moment. And, and again, one thing I think the arts do so well is they help us understand things when we're feeling um, like we need navigation. Certainly the thing I I want to champion is a lot more of those moments. You know, it's interesting because I I think sometimes we have this problem with network television that you want to try to bring people and say, hey, we offer something different, right? We have the same, pretty much the same demo as Lincoln Center. So let's just say like, uh, yes, it's not 100% and there may be younger people, right? But we kind of know our core audience. 
the problem that I that seems to present itself is for us when we when we kind of veer off and do slightly different kind of programming, it pisses off the old constituents and it doesn't necessarily bring in enough new ones to make it worth it. So I sort of thinking to myself because I went, you know, our niece took me to like the prototype festival and you see these new operas and mm-hmm. like these are so far from where what you might see at the Metropolitan Opera. But they brought out a lot of different kinds of people that maybe I never would have thought would be the kind of people who would flow into the Lincoln Center. How do you marry these two worlds? And not, I don't know, you want to respect the tradition, but also get them on the, the next pathway forward. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think a lot of the, the right questions are around how you invite people in. Right. And then how you reach out. So I'll give you an example for the, for the 60th anniversary of Lincoln Center. There's a block party. It's essentially an invitation to New York to come and engage with what we're doing and see what's going on there. And you will see, when you come to that block party, you will see it will look a lot like New York. Everyone from every background. And you see a lot of the the, the, mid, the Midsummer Night Swing, which is the... Love that. Love it, right? Fabulous. Yeah. So you have people dancing outside in the summer nights. Again, you look at that audience, it looks like New York. It's people of all ages, all backgrounds. So again, there's a myth around the arts, which I think we need to resist a bit, which is that the, the, the audiences are, are, are very standard, where actually the arts speak to everybody. I know we always talk about this. Musical theater is dead. Then you get Hamilton, right? right. Yep. You know, there is this sense that it's, it's tough. This is a tough business. Right. I think that's true. And I don't think we should, we should pretend otherwise. Right. One of the great arguments for the arts in general, and Lincoln Center in specific, is you have this huge breadth of creativity, right? And you will find all sorts of audiences, all sorts of ages, all sorts of backgrounds. The question is how you prioritize and and whose story you tell and where you emphasize. And there's definitely work to be done in general. But I think I, I, I am very bullish on the capacity of the arts to address the very set of issues that you're you're identifying. So when you look at all these different constituencies, each one has its own operating budget, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. But do they do they were dotted line up to you? No, or like, so, so it's just a separate entity? They're, they're all part of, I mean, uh, they're all part of a kind of spiritual connection, right, to Lincoln mm-hmm. Center, that we're all on the same campus and we're working together. And Lincoln Center, Link Inc., provides a bunch of services for all of the different uh, constituents on campus we look after much of the campus Mm -hmm. so that's our job and i think also thinking about how we collaborate together what the brand stands for together how Mm. we can create some shared value and and how one of the really interesting opportunities with lincoln center i think is you have these amazing institutions who you know there are lots of good duets between different organizations who work together sometimes Mm -hmm. and sometimes there are good kind of trios we over time i hope can build more of a kind of um, an ensemble on campus of people doing much more together um, whether that's back office or whether that's middle office or whether it's programming there are there are some efficiencies there that, that are obvious but they've been hard over the years because culturally these are organizations who see their worlds differently and so we've got some work to do on that the other part of the book that is interesting that came up for me is that um, you describe the post-millennial generation or gen z as the founders generation right explain that so there's a really interesting survey MTV did where they were they were talking about the generation who are coming after Gen Z, so the next gen, and what they wanted to be called. The name they liked the most was the founders. The founders, and the idea is that it's a generation of people who want to behave as if they're founders, not just followers, right? So they want to behave as if they are in charge of everything. They have lots of things they can do. They have a lot of transparency. They can see into things. They have a lot of agency. This generation of people who have been persuaded by their devices that they are important that they matter and that they ought to participate. They want to feel in the workplace not like they're cogs in a machine, but that they have high degrees of agency. It's a real challenge for the workplace because let's say you post a picture to your Facebook group saying, you know, here's me interviewing Henry Timms, right? All of your friends are going to say, hey, that's so great. You're terrific. Everything's wonderful. Like, 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 like. You get these artificial feedback loops from your friends which Mm. make you feel everything you do is terrific. And that's one of the reasons these platforms work. Mm -hmm. They work because they make everyone feel bought in and, and validate it. The problem is they don't provide accurate feedback. <laughs> what they do is they Right, just, you did a lousy job right. in that interview. Yeah, and that's a ter- you know, and that's and that Henry, that's a terrible shirt and you ought not to wear it and, and the answer you gave about this wasn't very clever. You actually don't get accurate feedback from your own social networks typically. Hmm. So people come into the workplace having been brought up in this world where they've been surrounded by these myths of validation and then their boss ignores them for a week and says, you know, that really wasn't a terrific report. And that's a really hard feeling for people Mm. so i think one of the big challenges for any sector is you have all these people now who expect to participate what are you doing with them right Mm. even people listening to this you know look at tv right now you know 50 percent of people are having a two-screen experience 
So they're looking at TV and they've got a phone in their hand because they want to do more than just download. They want to do something themselves. Mm. I'm sure people listening to this will be uh, on their phones doing something else at the same time. They might uh, be listening to you at two times the speed. And you sound very uh, different. So if I slow right yeah, now you down. Go. Now you're screwing them. Right. Sorry. Um, so, <laughs> so they might, because it, and so there, are all these, so there are all these interesting ways of people to think about participation, which is shifting. So the question for whether it's TV or radio or Lincoln Center, the question is, this generation of people who want to participate, how do you do that in meaningful terms that is not reducing to the lowest common denominator, which takes the kind of ambition that something like Lincoln Center lives on and translates that to a digital age? And that's going to be one of the big challenges, right? Because it's very easy to enter the shallow waters of the internet. Mm -hmm. It's hard to dive deep. Yeah. And so I think that's one of the big questions institutions like ours need to get right. You know, one of the things that I think is so powerful about these institutions is something that kind of transcends all the other digital lures that are out there. And that is you turn your phone off and you are immersed. I agree. I don't know if you saw the documentary about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, RBG. I watched the start. Um, and she, there's a part of it where she's attending the opera. Yeah. And I think it's her granddaughter or her daughter who says she goes to the opera because that's the place where she can escape. Right. And that's where you can just turn everything off and get sunk in with a story, get sunk in with the music, with the pageantry. You know, it's sort of one of those things where you not only is it moving to be part of it, but to have zero distractions in this day and age. I really agree. It's amazing. It's 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 what the kids call IRL. Yeah, right? in real t- it, right in it, real life. It, it, and the answer is IRL as it gets. Right, yeah. you actually get away. You really do reconnect with uh, with. I mean, look, it's weird because obviously I've much of my career has been trying to think about how you use technology. So I'm not I'm not in the kind of luddite anti tech zone, but I do think we know this that social media is is in many ways making us anxious and sad. Right, the yep. great myth of our age was. All this connectivity will bring us closer together, and it hasn't. It's actually forced us apart. Yep. So I think there's a big role for the arts. We have at the Lincoln Center something called the White Light Festival, which was has, was launched years ago, and it's an amazing festival of um, of things from around the world that help us understand ourselves. It helps us kind of find that inner light. And that festival's been a great success for years, but in today's world, it feels even more important to have those moments where you, you try to find... That, that space just to switch off from all the noise, to escape the algorithms just for a little while, right? So great. And, 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 and put yourself in the hands of, of people who are thinking so carefully about how you get to the heights of humanity. That, and that's really, at, its, at our very best, that's what the arts do so well. That is a good place to end. I'll do a little rapid fire. Opera composer, favorite opera composer, go. <laughs> well, I, I, saw, I saw the, um, the magic flute with my son, the Mets had this amazing performance for families. Yeah. And I took him, he was seven, and he doesn't... His greatest skill is not sitting still for long periods of time. And he was completely absorbed. Wow. It was an absolute gift. Okay. So I think that was... That, and, that, and if you haven't seen it, it just, it's, um, it's, it's a gift for kids. Like one of the nice things Lincoln Center does so well is these kind of family moments. Mm-hmm. So I think I, think I, would, I would give it to... All to right. For now. Um, Philharmonic ballet, best performance, like most exciting performance that you've seen in like the last year? So the thing that Phil did recently, which I thought was terrific, was something called Fill the Hall, where they had a concert which was particularly for people who helped New York. So there's a lot of first responders there, policemen, teachers. Cool. They opened up um, to audiences and they did a really terrific program. And uh, I, I went into that and I just thought it really felt like a New York community event. So I think that would be really All right. very, very high on the list. You want to do ballet? Do not say Swan Lake. I promise. Please. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd have to say. So the uh, the my my daughter is five, and she is absolutely convinced she is the greatest ballerina. Of who, course, she is. Who, the the only problem is it, it's that it, the, one thing. Of, any parent knows this. Confidence in children is a terrific thing. Her confidence is sky high in her capacity as a ballerina. She, however, does not share the belief that we have at Lincoln Center that great art requires practice. <laughs> uh, so she she is of the view that she doesn't need to do anything at all over the years mm. on her route to well, 
we're coming we'll, to it. We'll see how that works out. Anyway, for her. I took her to the. I took her first full ballet. We went to the Nutcracker, and um, and it was just a joy to behold. Oh, that's and, beautiful. Yeah, so so anyway, but so she she with no practice at all will be doubtless performing on stage in a decade. Fantastic. Favorite non Lincoln Center show like Broadway, Off Broadway, Off Off Broadway. I've been so focused on Lincoln Center in the last year. This is better I saw than, My Fair Lady twenty two yeah, times. This, this, is, this, is, this, is, this, is a, this is a slight danger. And goes out the way. I think the thing. I think the thing which I think I saw, which um, which I found the most powerful at the Y was um, we had a performance under a shift. It was right after. It must have been the hurricane. Was, was what Sandy? Year? Sandy. What year was that? Uh, Sandy was. Like, 2013? Yeah, 13 or something. And anyway, it was like two or three days afterwards and it was all like, should we do it, should we not do it? And all of that was going on and we did and we, we did it. And um, it was the most, and we thought nobody would come and of course it's New York, it, every seat was full. Mm. And it finished and he came out for the encore. This was after, you know, this second night of this extraordinary virtuoso performance. And he came out for the encore and as an encore, he started the piece all over again. Get out. So he, he started the first prelude all over again. And it was this amazing, and he, big smile on his face. And it was this amazing message of of, of kind of rebirth. This idea mm-hmm. that actually, after these amazing things, you actually just pick it up and you start all over again. And I remember thinking that was as moved as I've been in a very long time. Last question. Yeah. We started with your best financial or career decision. You, yeah. you said career. Would you like to pop in with your worst? I don't think I thought very seriously about the long term when I was younger. I think I could have done so much more in my twenties financially if I had been if I had been thinking. That there was um, there was a future past Friday night. Yeah, and basically for much of my twenties, I didn't really think there was a future past. But Friday think night. about how many pints you enjoyed. I did enjoy <laughs> quite a lot of pints, um, but had I enjoyed slightly fewer and thought more about long term asset building, I think in retrospect I'd have had less fun, but it probably would have been smarter. So I think the thing I would have do over again would probably be that. Henry Timms, thank you so much for joining us. What a treat. Thanks to Henry Timms. Go check out all the great stuff going on at Lincoln Center. If you live in New York, do it. And if you're visiting New York, please go ahead and do that. We drop new episodes of Jill on Money on Tuesdays and Thursdays. If you'd like to get on the air with us and you've got a financial question, just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. You can get the show anywhere you get your podcast: Apple, Google Play, Radio.com, Stitcher, wherever. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. We're distributed by Cadence 13. And the show is presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Any questions? Just hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com. See you next week.